The 6 o'clock news starts right now. One man is dead after a one vehicle accident on the city's near north side. We first told you about this wreck at 5 o'clock today. San Antonio police responding to the 3300 block of North St. Mary Street a little before 430 this afternoon. When they got there, they say they found a man believed to be in his 50s behind the wheel of an SUV that had rolled over on its side after crashing into other vehicles. Yeah, I think one vehicle is responsible, but there are more than one vehicle that was involved in this whole thing. Officers say it appears the SUV ran off the road into the parking lot, hit a car, another SUV before rolling over. Right now, police say they aren't sure what caused the man to lose control or what killed him. No one else was hurt, but police do tell us there was a woman in that other SUV when it was hit. When we asked viewers what questions they wanted city council candidates to answer, a large share focused on beautification and ridding public areas of trash. The San Antonio River Authority has been focusing on that issue. It, crews have been picking up large amounts of trash along the mission reach of the San Antonio River Walk. Tiffany Huertas has a look at the harmful effects of littering and how you can help protect our natural resources. We come out here, it's just calm, relaxing. It's just a nice place to come and walk. Manuel Escobar enjoys the mission hike and bike trails, but things look different these days. You see a lot of the, the nice parts of it, but then kind of look to your left, look to your right, and you kind of see the, the built up of trash and things that are hidden along inside the brush. Kristen Hansen with the San Antonio River Authority says the recent rain has washed up unwanted litter into the San Antonio River. And each time it rains and the river rises, litter gets deposited along the banks of both sides of the San Antonio River. So we've had staff and also uh, contractor crews out helping assist us in, in picking up all of that litter. Staff with the San Antonio River Authority has been finding plastic containers, plastic bags, and other items along the river. In two weeks, they collected 21,000 pounds of trash. The long lasting effects is that it's, it affects the wildlife negatively. It affects our water quality. Hansen says if you want to help, remember to dispose your trash properly and place items in a trash can. Also, make sure your trash is secure. Another way to help is by getting involved with the River Warrior Volunteer Program and help keep the creeks and rivers clean. The more people who come out and enjoy the San Antonio River, whether it's cycling or kayaking, if you're close to the river, you'll want to protect the river. And maybe you won't litter next time you, you have that opportunity. Tiffany Huertas, KSET 12 News. The new at six, the relaxation of COVID-19 guidance from the Centers for Disease Control, raising concerns about the impact of those recommendations on the operation of the Bear County court system. In-person jury trials set to begin in two weeks. Paul Venema with what the local administrative judge is saying about those guidelines and whether he's going to change the rules. Following this schedule released last week, in-person jury trials will start on June 1st. We are going to continue with the minimum standard protocols that I have already filed. He's talking about masks and social distancing protocols put in place by the Texas Supreme Court. There's an arm of the Texas Supreme Court called the Office of Court Administration, and they've given us best practices to consider and to follow. And frankly, I'm going to follow those um, to a T. I done. Is it? Yes. Noting that 64% of the local eligible population have already had their first vaccination and nearly 50% are fully vaccinated, Ron Help said he's optimistic. In the long term, it is very promising to see what the CDC is telling us and what the local leaders are telling us as well. But as it's been since the outset of the pandemic, he says public safety is his top priority. I would never want anybody to be injured as a result of the decisions that we make here in the courthouse. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News. Despite an ample supply of the COVID-19 vaccine, health officials continue to have trouble getting more people vaccinated. Some areas around the country are providing big incentives to sway people to get their vaccine, like Ohio's million dollar lottery and college scholarship contest. At a Metro Health vaccination clinic today in downtown San Antonio, paletas were there to sweeten the pot for attendees. But the agency's medical director says other incentives could be in the future. I think there need to be careful discussions about around ethics, around you know what's feasible, but definitely other kinds of incentives are, are on the table. 
For now, Metro Health and other providers are hosting clinics around the county to make it easy as possible to get more people vaccinated. And the agency hopes that more people will be swayed to get the vaccine by their own doctors or maybe even their own faith leaders. It is a mural aimed at shedding light on what's important to San Antonio, the people. Today, city leaders unveiling the first COVID vaccine mural. It's all part of a citywide campaign to feature local artists who they hope will inspire every person to be vaccinated. Depicted in the mural is Southside resident Arturo Valdez, a close friend of the mural's artist. Mr. Valdez actually recently retired from Kelly Lackland. The mural's artist says every detail has a meaning, even the colors he selected. It's a monochromatic red with a black and a white. And I think those are, uh, that's gonna add that, that visual connection between all the works and to show the versatility of our local muralists. The mural took a month to make in the studio and a couple of days to install at its current location. A man who was shot at an East Bear County home overnight had broken in and attacked a woman, according to sheriff's investigators. All of this happened at that home in the 8200 block of Real Road, not far from Highway 87. As Katrina Weber reports, investigators say the shooter was defending the woman. Gunfire brought Bear County Sheriff's deputies to this home in the 8200 block of Real Road. Only later did they learn the shots were fired in response to another crime. They say a man broke into his ex-girlfriend's home around 4.30 this morning, then began assaulting her with a gun. At some point, they say the woman's father grabbed his own gun and fired at the man, wounding him in the face. The wounded man was rushed to a hospital, initially in critical condition. Crime scene investigators carefully went through the home, collecting evidence and also focused on a car parked nearby. Detectives showed up too and stayed for hours, talking to everyone involved. By daylight, they had formed a clear picture of what happened. They seemed to determine this was a case of a property owner protecting his family against an unwelcome intruder. The man with the gunshot wound in his face is also facing criminal charges connected to the assault on the woman. The man who deputies say shot him is not facing any charges. Reporting from East Bear County, Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. No charges expected for a driver. Police say hit and killed a man trying to cross a street on the west side late last night. Officers responding to South Zarzamora in San Fernando around 10 o'clock. They say a man in his 50s was crossing Zarzamora when a pickup heading north hit him. The driver of that truck stopped and tried to help. The unidentified victim was taken to University Hospital where he died. According to police, the driver had the green light and the victim, who was wearing dark clothing, was not in a crosswalk. Do you have plans for the weekend? Are you going to venture out for the first time in a long time without your mask? Ooh, that'll be a big step. Maybe that's what's playing out on the 281 South at Loop 410 West ramp right now. You can see very busy on both the ramp and 410 itself as you look down at the roadway, but no major traffic accidents to tell you about. New at six from abuse survivor to advocate to executive director of a new nonprofit. A San Antonio woman is using her personal experience to help others who have endured many types of trauma. Courtney Friedman caught up with her and her team as they prepare for their first ever community event tomorrow. Karen Chatham Dozier's trauma started in her childhood home. To survive childhood molestation and then later on survive family violence. You've seen her on KSAT before, writing and performing plays to empower abuse survivors, but she's always had a bigger plan. I believe you can help people. They trust you better when you can relate. Within the past year, she's created a new ministry called We Speak Up. Welcome, welcome. She was proud to show us her brand new office at the Barbara Jordan Community Center on the east side, accessible to community members who have been through trauma. What I can do is facilitate post-traumatic coping skills with you. I have a master's in human sciences with a specialization in psychology. She's not a counselor, but a facilitator who helps her clients form plans and find resources. I've had someone who came to me after surviving and now choosing to thrive after being shot. She wants the public to know she's open for business. Come Saturday, this room will be all set up and full of people, of course, wearing masks and social distancing, supporting We Speak Up, but also seeking help of their own. The event will include prayer and poetry featuring professional poets. I am so full 
I am soulful. Like God himself descended from heaven and filled my belly with small blessings. Chatham says SAPD's crisis response team officers will also be there to help abuse victims with safety plans and other services. It can be a generational curse if somebody doesn't do anything to stop it. Her goal to break that cycle of Community Center at 2803 East Commerce from 6 until 10 o'clock at night. There will also be free HIV testing and COVID-19 vaccine registration available. A look outside with live cam. Steve asking about our weekend plans. Of course, we're wondering how rain might affect those. Justin. Very good question. We are expecting some showers and storms to return tomorrow. They're in the forecast Saturday and Sunday. Some better chances as we get into next week, I think. Let's take a look at the almanac. So far today, 82, the high temperature, 63, the low this morning. Turned into a pretty nice day. We've had a nice stretch here, below average temperatures. We're going to see humidity on the rise, though, tonight, and it will be a bit breezy from time to time. 78 degrees at 8 o'clock, 74, 10 o'clock by midnight. We're looking at 71, mostly cloudy skies. We'll talk about the timing of those rain chances tomorrow and take a look ahead to next week coming up in just a bit. Steve. Thank you, Justin. Even though the San Antonio Spurs couldn't bring home the win, they still have a shot at getting into the NBA playoffs. Larry Ramirez with how the silver and black managed to lock down the number 10 spot. Still to come in sports. And some of the sickest COVID-19 patients have had to rely on ventilators to help them breathe. How a cutting edge system may help deliver potent drugs directly to damaged lungs. Next. Local theme parks and water parks are gearing up for summer fun. The post-COVID challenges they're facing coming up tonight. Even though the number of new COVID cases is dropping across Texas, many who already had it are still suffering from it. Many times the lungs get horribly damaged by the virus and ventilators become the last resort for these patients to get enough oxygen. Ursula Perry now with a new drug delivery system to save the lungs of the COVID patients. More than 31 million Americans have become sick with COVID since the pandemic began. And in that time, pulmonologists have learned so much more about how the virus attacks the lung. We recognized that COVID did the same thing that pulmonary hypertension does to the blood vessels of the lungs. It causes a dropout of these pulmonary vessels so that the conduits to which the body delivers blood to the lungs to get oxygen and we're disappearing. Now researchers at Ohio State are testing a new way to deliver medication directly to the damaged blood vessels. The Ventapro system works along with mechanical ventilators to generate and deliver small droplets of an inhaled medication. It involves an even distribution of this drug, which is called epoprostenol. Uh, to the affected uh, areas of the blood vessels. Doctors say this method of directly delivering the drug often opens up the blood vessels, improves oxygenation, and reduces strain on the heart. Patients in the clinical trial will receive 10 days of treatment to see if it improves the circulatory and respiratory systems. Then they are monitored for four weeks to see if it actually will reduce the amount of time on a mechanical ventilator. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Look out sky with sky 12 this evening. Look at that. Yeah, flying high above the pearl. We've talked about this view before. If you haven't seen that, the grassy area, those white circles, encouraging the social distancing. Yeah, but it looks like there are a whole lot of people out there enjoying 
their Friday night, Justin. Yeah. Might as well. I mean, it is beautiful out there this evening, honestly. Uh, we are seeing some, some pretty good weather. Um, what we're going to see, though, are some changes starting this weekend. And as we get into next week, some rain chances are going to start to kick in. And uh, we'll see rain chances really jump up as we get into uh, Tuesday, it looks like. Okay, let's go outside and show you the uh, time lapse from today. We had a beautiful start. Some clouds drifting in, though, towards the afternoon. That's that humidity starting to feed in here. And uh, right now we're sitting at 81 degrees. East southeasterly winds at 13. Dew point is at 62. That number is uh, definitely on the rise. Temperature wise, 78 Bandera, 81 Hondo, 85 down there in Pleasanton, 81 in New Braunfels. It's a warm afternoon, but not hot. We're still below average. 79 in Uvalde, 72 Rock Springs. Clouds are a little thicker out west today, so that's why those numbers are a little bit lower. Here's the important number, though, I think, because uh, dew points are in the low 60s. We're starting to feel it it's in the muggy territory. And we're starting to see some 60s, high 60s and low 70s along the coast. That's all going to feed in, so it's going to get much more humid. And that's going to set the stage as our pattern becomes a little bit more unstable as we get into, again, the weekend and next week. Uh, set the stage for some thunderstorms. This moisture's already made it all the way up into the Texas Panhandle, and there's already some uh, activity up there. In fact, severe weather lining up from far northwest Texas down towards the uh, Amarillo area. And there's a ton of warnings out there right now. So that'll be the busy area tonight. And then we're going to watch what's going on out in Mexico. All this flow here, these disturbances off to our west, those will be working in tomorrow. Now, it's not going to rain all day on your Saturday or Sunday for that matter, but with some of this energy and that moisture in place, we should see some activity. Here's what one of our computer models is thinking. This is 7 o'clock. We've got some showers off to the west of San Antonio, maybe out towards Del Rio tomorrow morning. And then by midday, we're going to see more showers and storms. We're not really looking for severe weather tomorrow. I think it's mostly in the form of showers and rumbles of thunder. This will be around into the afternoon. And then Saturday night, we'll watch what happens out west because some of that could cluster together, work its way towards San Antonio by Sunday morning. So there could be some periods of rain here, but as I mentioned, it's not going to be an all day rain event, both Saturday or Sunday. Forecast for this evening, 78 by 8 o'clock, 74, 10 o'clock. We'll be down to 71 by midnight. Mostly cloudy skies again. The evening looks good. And then tomorrow, rain chances do kick in. About a 40% shot, 10 a.m. noontime towards 3 o'clock. And the temperatures will be up near 80, low 80s once again. Southeast Julia winds 10 to 15. Down the line, we'll get a stronger area of low pressure that moves in on Tuesday. And this is a day I want to watch because we'll have the upper level support and this is when we could see some severe weather. I think Tuesday afternoon into Tuesday evening. We could see some heavy rain out of this too. And rain chances don't end there. They continue after that. So this is going to be a busy week. And you can see that in the seven day forecast. Again, 40% chance tomorrow, 40% chance on Sunday. Just some periods of rain, temperatures in the 80s. And then as we get into Monday, 30% will be in between storm systems. 70% chance on Tuesday. And it's Tuesday into Wednesday, that time frame when we're going to watch for some strong storms potentially. And still some 40% chances of rain there Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Temperatures stay in the 80s. I mean, we are in May, so we would, we would expect to see some of these str stronger storms. But this is a pretty busy pattern considering we were dry for so long. And now it feels like <laughs> it's all sort of hitting at once. But we'll be here to let you know how it uh, unfolds and we'll let you know if it, uh, if it does indeed get a little busy next week. Guys. Yeah, it's yeah, hitting over and over and over it again. It's wild to see. That's All the one chances. issue we're going to have is maybe some flooding yep. down the line. All right, thanks, yep. Justin. All right, I believe it was Shaquille O'Neal who once called him the big fundamental. <laughs> After yes. this weekend, you can call him a Hall of Famer. Yes, and uh, Tim Duncan had uh, media avail today along with the other Hall of Famers, and he was asked, what does this mean for the city of San Antonio and the franchise? Now, we posted his answer on Twitter, which you are about to hear coming up in a second, and Spurs fans are replying with the crying emoji. Yes, Tim Duncan pulling at your heartstrings again. Plus, the Spurs backed into the play-in series. We got it coming up. Tomorrow night, the Mohegan Sun in Connecticut, Tim Duncan will officially become a member of the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame. Tim headlines the class along with Kobe Bryant and Kevin Garnett, Timmy, Kobe, and KG. No last name needed. Today, during the Class of 2020 media availability, Duncan was asked what was it like facing Kobe year after year. 
your greatest competition brings the, the, the best out of you. And, uh, and that's, that's what he always did. You always had to be uh, at your best and bring your best uh, from start to finish um, if you were playing against him or any of his teams. And uh, um, I think that's what I appreciate about uh, uh, remembering playing against him and being on the court with him. Uh, uh, a fierce competitor um, and uh, uh, always demanding more of his team and his teammates than probably was possible. But he, he, wanted, the, he wanted to win that much, he wanted it that much, and uh, 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 it was an honor to share the court with him. Their battles were fun to watch. Now, Tim was also asked, what does it mean to the city of San Antonio and the Spurs franchise to have another member of the Silver and Black enter the Hall of Fame? We have a, hopefully a couple coming down the pipeline. Um, I'm honored to be um, the, the next in line, but um, throughout our time, throughout my time there, uh, what incredible teammates I've had that I hope to be doing this for in, in coming years. Um, but uh, the city of San Antonio uh, was the perfect place for me. Uh, 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 the city, the fans, the organization, um, all the way down the line. And I'm honored to represent that here. The enshrinement ceremony starts tomorrow at 4.30 p.m. local time, live on ESPN, and Hall of Famer David Robinson will present Duncan. At one point, it was looking like the Spurs would beat the Knicks last night and grab the final play-in tournament spot with the dub, but they blew a 17-point third-quarter lead and fell to the Knicks 102-98. That's the bad news. The good news, Memphis beat Sacramento, ending the Kings' hopes of overtaking the Spurs for 10th in the West. So the Spurs are locked in at number 10 and hope to use their final two games of the regular season to build up some momentum. One, making sure we have a positive rhythm offensively and defensively, kind of get this bad feeling of losing these last two games um, off us and kind of just play for, for confidence, understanding what we need to do, um, getting that rhythm, um, things like that, that definitely something that we could definitely use to carry over to going to Memphis. Memphis will play at Golden State Sunday, and that game will decide eight and nine in the West per the NBA. The Sunday clash will decide the tiebreaker between the Warriors and Grizzlies. Winner gets eighth, loser ninth, and that team will face the Spurs in the play-in series. So Spurs will host the Suns tomorrow and Sunday at the AT&T Center, the end of regular season. Both games are set for 1 p.m. Damar and Jakob are out for rest in game one, and Rudy and DeJounte are questionable. Guys? Thank you, Larry. Thank You're welcome. You, Larry. We'll be right back. 211,000 Bear County High School students were part of a report, part of a study on youth employment. Among the key findings, nearly three out of four high school students worked for pay at some point during their high school years. The Urban Education Institute at the University of Texas San Antonio conducted this study uh, in conjunction with SA Works. Funded by USAA, Mike Villarreal is the director of the Urban Education Institute. He, along with Sonny Fong from the School to Career Director at SA Works, are our case had Q&A guests today. Mike, you obviously you're involved in this study. Obviously, you looked at what the results are. What did it tell you? Mm. Uh, big takeaway uh, number one is that youth employment is an important part of the development of young people in San Antonio. <clears throat> we, before the pandemic, we had uh, above average, above the national average participation in employment. Um, and, and my concern after the pandemic is that we're gonna need to rebound back because we learned that it's a very positive force in developing young people and their career ambitions and exposing them to new careers in their lives. Finding work, keeping work especially, it's been a challenge across so many industries over the last year. Uh, Sonny, I wanna ask you, given the information that we have seen in this study, what are the next steps for young people who are looking for a job, who want a job? Uh, what should we do with this going forward? Well, certainly from the employer perspective, um, the message is uh, we've had uh, the, the industries that have traditionally employed students. So, you know, um, entertainment and hospitality, those have been hardest hit 
So those jobs are just not there in the numbers that they need to be. So what we want is for other sectors, Mike mentioned um, STEM. So the STEM careers, uh, they're growing, they're bursting at the seams and they need talent. And if we want that talent to be, um, we want talent now, but we want a sustained pipeline of talent, we have to invest in that talent now. And one of the most effective um, investments that we can make in that talent to develop it is through internships, is through youth employment. So the message is folks in manufacturing, folks in IT, cybersecurity, biosciences, finance, we want you to step up and offer those opportunities to our youth um, through SA Works. We have um, 16 years and up students who are enrolled in Bayer County high schools who are available to work. We have over 370 so far that are signed up and looking for jobs. We want that all 370 to have jobs. Mike, talk more about that. Talk more about, you know, when you talk about employment, I mean, that can take many different forms. I mean, it could take paid internship. It could be a mentorship program. I mean, is that some, some of the things that you looked at in this study? You're, you're, you're absolutely right. We're, we're really looking at uh, basically three types of ways young people get exposed to careers. There's the traditional having a part-time job for an extended period of time. There's an internship, which is uh, a few hours for a very focused amount of time, maybe during the summer. And then there's job shadowing opportunities, which essentially looks like a field trip where a young person gets to shadow, let's say, an engineer during their day or a financial data analyst at USAA, seeing what they do in their day and bringing to life uh, what it means to, to pursue that kind of career. Um, this is really important. This is so important in our community, especially where our children are coming from uh, first generation college going families where they're going to be the first in their family to to go to college, having them get exposed to these new industry sectors that we're trying to grow that offer uh, uh, high wages is really important to get them to not just have a, a goal of I want to be an engineer and have that on a post-it note on a billboard on a on a, a, a cork board, but rather have it be an internalized goal where they really see themselves. Yes, that's what I want to do. I know somebody who's doing it. I identify with them. Um, the existing research suggests that this is really a transformational element in the development of our young people. It needs to be there. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, Mike, because we're not just talking about summer jobs where mm -hmm. teenagers can earn some spending money when they're not in school. Uh, Sonny, you talked about this. You touched on it a little bit when you were referencing a pipeline of talent in San Antonio. Can you talk about the benefits to an employer and the San Antonio economy as a whole if companies invest in younger employers and, and try to grow them uh, within their company? Absolutely. So for one thing, um, we know that students, many students have no idea of the landscape of companies in San Antonio. I'll give you a small example. Most students think that HEB is a grocery store and that's the end of it. They don't understand the IT, the cybersecurity, the logistics, all the gamut of careers that are available through a company like HEB. So, and there are many companies that they have no idea about. So one strong benefit for the employer is that they get that recognition. Students begin to identify that company as a possible um, employer for me in the future which is great for our, for the company, but also for our economy generally, because otherwise they're gonna leave. They're gonna go somewhere else and find employment. And that's not what we want. The other key thing is um, for employers, they're able to actually start developing those very strong uh, employability or professional skills that we always hear from employers is lacking in the workforce. There is, we need work ethic and we need diligence and we need, problem solving and communication skills. And one of the things our surveys of our interns year over year has shown us is that, that is where they have the greatest improvement, the greatest jump in their skill set, just the confidence that they have. And so right there and then you're actually crafting the skills that you need as an employee. You're developing that skill. So you're developing the loyalty to your company, possibly, and you're also developing the, the skills that you know you'll need now and in the future. So 
it's a win for our companies and absolutely a win for our students as well. You know, what I'm hoping is that not only students are watching, but also employees are watching this, company heads are watching this and saying, you know what, let's get involved in that. If they want to do that, uh, I have an email or I have a, a link in front of me that I think would be the best, but you correct me, Sonny, if it's not. It's sanantonioedf.com slash workforce slash programs. That's the best place to go if you want to sign up for this internship program or if you're a company interested. Absolutely, best place. And I'd also add that we're having a training session for employers to help them to understand how to structure their internships so it can be as successful as possible. And that's happening on the 19th of May. That's next week, Wednesday at nine o'clock. It's virtual. And we'd invite every employer to sign up. Same link that you mentioned, Steve, they can find information on that training program and sign up to be a, be a part of it. And my email address is on the website as well, so they can contact me directly. Great. Hey, Mike, final question before we go. This is a study that was done over two decades. Are you seeing certain trends play out over those two decades in where kids are finding jobs? Uh, yes, you know, a couple of two big takeaways from that analysis uh, that, that tracks 15 years of uh, cohorts of students over time. Number one, the recession of 2008 hit our young people hard. In, and their employment rates have not fully rebounded uh, the way they were once before the 08 recession. Concerned about the pandemic-induced recession may have the same effect where we see a, a ratchet down of youth employment that doesn't fully rebound. And so that's why this call to employers is really important. But another piece here is that we investigated to see if the students who are taking AP courses at the highest levels, dual credit courses, kids who are really preparing for college, and we wanted to know, are they finding employment at any lesser rates than others? And the answer was no. In exposure to employment, learning at a workplace, uh, we have discovered is something that uh, all kids are taking part in, even those who are preparing to go to college and taking a full load of rigorous high school coursework. That's a good thing. Mike Villarreal from the UTSA Urban Education Institute and Sonny Fong from SA Works. Thanks so much for being with us. Glad to be with you. Have a great weekend. We'll be right back. All right, put this on the list of things that do not mix. Hand sanitizer, smoking, and driving. Sheesh. A driver in Maryland learned that the hard way. According to police in Rockville, the driver was smoking a cigarette after using a hand sanitizer, and within minutes, the car was filled with flames. They were able to get out of the car with non-life-threatening injuries. Fire crews were able to get the fire out pretty quickly. Obviously not quick enough to save the car. Whew. No one was hurt. That is wild. Look outside with live cam this evening. A beautiful way to end the week. 82 degrees out there. We're wondering how things are going to shake up for the weekend, Justin. Everything's going to change. We're still going to see uh, some decent weather, but rain chances will start to kick in Saturday, Sunday, and even more so as we get into early next week. Right now, we're sitting at 81 degrees. East southeasterly winds at 13. Dew point is coming up. So if you're going to be outside tonight, just know it is going to be a little bit more humid forecast for those temperatures to dip down into the 60s overnight and then rain chances kick in tomorrow morning. We'll have a closer look at that forecast coming up. Not much can get some buzz going like a big lottery jackpot. And tonight's Mega Millions drawing certainly fits the bill. The jackpot is now at $430 million and will probably climb a little bit higher before the actual drawing. This is just the second time it has surpassed the $400 million mark during the month of May. No one has won since back on February 16th. To win all that money, you have to match all five balls plus the Mega Ball. And here's the dash of reality. It's probably not going to happen. You've got a better chance of just about everything else in the universe, like being admitted to the emergency room with a pogo stick related injury. That is like a very that's there's better odds stat. of that happening. And I haven't been on a pogo stick in a long dash time. Dash of reality <laughs> or dash of hopes. Yeah. As we start getting back to normal, hopefully it won't be long before we start going to festivals and sporting events, which means 
the chicken dance. If you need to practice, today is a good day to start. It is National Chicken Dance Day. The song was written in the 1950s by a Swiss accordionist. It didn't catch on here in the U.S. until the 1970s, but when it took off, Oh, it really took off. It's a staple at school dances, live sporting events, worst fest in New Braunfels, weddings. Oh, yeah. The world record for the longest chicken dance happened in North Dakota in 2010. It covered 24 city blocks, was more than 1.6 miles long. Now, the fact that the longest chicken dance took place in North Dakota and Adam Kasky went to college in North Dakota, <laughs> perhaps around that same time, I do not think is a coincidence. Mm -hmm. I mean, some things you just don't have to question. Yeah. It's true. <laughs> uh, Adam would be doing the chicken dance right now. I absolutely, absolutely believe that. Um, you know, the thing about that song, too, is it never gets out of your head. It does I mean, it's not. It's there forever. It's, it's right. in there now. It is. Yeah. Stuck. Yeah. You're welcome, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> okay, here's what to expect as we head into the weekend. Uh, we're uh, looking at some rain chances coming back. Now, if you're heading out tonight, looks great. Humid, breezy, mild. Uh, you'll notice the humidity perhaps a little bit more. Scattered showers and storms show up this weekend. It will not rain all weekend, but there will be some rain around. And then next week, there is a potential for some severe storms. Heavy rain will also be an issue next week, I think. Uh, right now, we're looking at 81 degrees at the airport. East southeasterly winds at 13 miles per hour, and that is ushering in all that moisture that you feel out there. Big picture shows we've got some storms firing up in the Texas Panhandle. Severe weather lining up from uh, far northwest Texas into the Amarillo area, and then those will continue to push east. We're watching all this activity out here over Mexico and far west Texas. That's energy that's moving in our direction, and I think it will be here by tomorrow morning. We'll start to see some showers. Uh, out west initially, and then some of that will work towards San Antonio by midday. In the meantime, nothing out there right now. 78 degrees, Bull Verde, 77 Canyon Lake. We're at 83 at Stinson, 85 down there in Pleasanton. So it was a fairly warm day, it just wasn't hot. Uh, we've really lucked out this week. It's been really pretty gorgeous. 81 Kennedy, close to 90 there in Cadua, and there's a look at the dew points. So once we get into the 60s, that's the muggy range. You start to feel it a little bit more, and those even higher dew points are just sitting to our south and east, and we'll move into the area tonight. So the dew point tracker shows we'll get climbing dew points into next week. Uh, we'll be close to 70 most of next week, and that, again, will set the stage for the potential of uh, some storms. Wind gusts right now, not a big deal, but we do have a good southeast chilly breeze. It may gust up to around 20 miles per hour or so occasionally tonight, so just adds up there. Here's what our forecast looks like. Uh, I mentioned tomorrow morning we may start to see some showers out west, and then by midday, this model shows scattered showers and storms. Uh, it'll be a hit or miss type situation. Right now we're going with a 40% chance of rain, but there could be some decent downpours here and there. And then as we get into tomorrow night, uh, more additional coverage out west, and that may work its way east by Sunday morning. So we'll have to watch for that potential. If that moves through, we may not see much Sunday afternoon. But if it doesn't, then we'll see more scattered showers and storms on Sunday. Forecast for tomorrow, 40% chance of rain. As I mentioned, 10 a.m. noontime, 3 o'clock. Temperatures will be up in the low 80s once again. Very quickly, down the line, we're going to watch what happens with this area of low pressure that comes out uh, from the west. There is a severe potential as we get into Tuesday and the potential of heavy rain, too. Seven-day rainfall potential here. We're talking three to five inches in some cases. Now, that's just an estimate, but uh, we do think that uh, the flooding could become a problem next week. So something to watch. Here's how the seven-day plays out. 83 on Sunday. 87 Monday, just a 30% chance of rain Monday. But we bumped that up to a 70% chance on Tuesday. That's where that severe potential will lie. And the, even after that, we'll see more storms Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So a very busy setup in the seven-day forecast, guys. Yeah, looks like it. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, Justin. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. Friday, it's May 14th. And turning now to an update on the temporary migrant housing facility at the Freeman Coliseum Expo Hall, the Department of Health and Human Services is shutting it down this month. The facility opened in March, and at one point there were more than a thousand teens who crossed the U.S.-Mexico border alone who were staying there. But because DHHS says they're seeing fewer unaccompanied kids arrive at border facilities, 
They'll be closing the Freeman site on May 30th. There are currently more than 700 teens still there. DHHS says they will be placed with sponsors by the end of the month or relocated to another site. Police left with a lot of questions after another overnight shooting. This one happened a little after 1230 at the Star Inn at 410 near Ingram. Investigators tell us a man was found dead in a hotel room. He had been shot in the head. Right now it's unclear exactly what led to the shooting, but we're told the suspected shooter eventually showed up at a police substation. Meantime, retail, the retail industry showing some signs that it is struggling to rebound from last year. The Census Bureau reporting today that retail sales during the month of April fell 0.8% from March sales, which had increased more than 10%. One reason for that surge in March could be the stimulus checks from the COVID relief plan. More of San Antonio's children are getting the job, getting the jab rather. This is video of SAISD students who are getting their vaccines provided by Baptist Health System. This process is happening very quickly. Baptist Health System is not the only vaccine clinic that is expanding to kids 12 to 15. We have a full list of other vaccine opportunities at ksat.com. All right, temperatures are down in the 70s now. We'll see a nice evening, but by tomorrow's showers and storms, back in the forecast, about a 40% chance both Saturday and Sunday. It's not going to rain all weekend, but just know there will be some times where some showers and storms will be around. 30% chance Monday, but we bump it up to a 70% shot on Tuesday. That's when there is a threat for some stronger storms. And through this whole period, mainly next week, we're going to worry about the threat for a little bit of heavy rain too, guys. Weather team's going to be busy next week. Indeed. <laughs> Thanks for watching the news at 6. See you back here on the Night Beat at 10.